Welcome to another Lightblade Learning Lab. As you can see, I'm in a fairly relaxed mood today, to start with anyway, because what I'm going to do today is to talk about acrylic. There are two big problems when you come to cut or engrave acrylic. One of them is the edge striations, and the other is all the deposit of acrylic vapour that gets put down onto the surface. The reason why I'm relaxed is because I've already done the first part of this video on my other machine. I did some experimental work over there to show you that striations are a natural phenomena. They're not necessarily to do with the stepper motor. Although I think you'll realize by the end of this session that the main reason for the striations on the edge of your acrylic is the stepper motor. But there are two mechanisms that cause striations and that's where we're going to start off. We're going to start off with the natural striations. So sit back and prepare to be bored for the next 10 minutes by one of my lectures. Now I was trying to produce absolutely step-free steady motion with a small lead screw and a synchronous AC motor which runs off the mains through a very large gearbox to make sure that we get absolutely steady rotational speed and that motor is then acting through a positive acting lead screw, a multi-start lead screw. Now this time I've mounted the lead screw in a couple of bearings so that it runs absolutely true and steady um, and I've also driven it off of a motor here which is not fixed to the actual mechanism itself. So the motor can wobble around and do what it wants but the lead screw cannot. If you look carefully here you'll see that we're on the end of this bearing slide there are a couple of rubber pads on the end, scraper pads, and I've made a little shoe which fits over the rubber pads and is smaller than the overall length so that there is no play in this head. It's a little bit of compression there. So I've tried to remove every possible way that we're going to get slop or random motion in the mechanism. I've just clamped it on the top here because it doesn't need to be any more than that. It's only got to be constrained from moving in this direction so that we get good movement in the head. I have disconnected the belt for a very good reason. I don't mind this machine moving in Y, although I shan't be moving it in Y. You'll see my X stepper motor here and when I drive it left and right you can see that it's still working. Now because it's an open loop system it doesn't know that it's not connected to the head. So this does allow me a little bit of flexibility. I can actually send a program to the machine, which I am going to be doing later, and I'm going to try and fool the machine to do something that I want to test. I haven't put the extractor on at the moment, but we'll do that in a minute. I'll run it for as long as I can, and I'll just watch the top before it crashes into the end stop. There we go. Now we haven't got a through cut here. We've got a closed cut. And a closed cut always causes a ploughed field effect along the bottom here. But what we're more interested in is not the roughness of the surface, but the uniformity of the line itself. We can see clearly we've got a uniform cut. We've got uniform power. So how can I have striations in the background? And those striations are also showing signs of drag. Now I'm using fairly low power in here, so it does mean to say that I'm not generating a huge amount of heat in the cut itself. So consequently the cut has not had a chance to uh, melt and heal over the striations. Now I'll talk about the melting process and the healing process in a few minutes, but let's go and observe what this first test has shown us. I've hacked away the front edge of the material here. I've ground away the bottom and broken it so that I don't damage this surface internally here. Okay, so that we can see the striations. This is probably one of the most difficult things I've ever tried to show you. There we go. Look, at the bottom left-hand corner there, you can clearly see the striations coming down and curling away at the bottom. I think the first question we have to ask is how 
how is it possible to get these striations when we don't have any intermittent movement, we don't have any pulsing air, and we know we've got a steady beam because we can see the line is flat as it cuts its way into that material. I've got some rather nice acrylic blocks here which I'm very happy to destroy for the sake of science. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fire that same 15% laser beam at that surface there. And what I'd like you to do is just observe what happens. Now we've done this before, but I'm going to hold the pulse button on. Now 15% probably will be enough energy instantly turn this surface here to liquid, but before you even see any liquid, it'll evaporate. Now you can see it's still evaporating, but sooner or later, look, you can just see around the outside here, can you see that liquid forming now? Here's what we've just produced. And as you can clearly see, we've got a point at the bottom, which is where the high energy density is in the beam. But as we get further and further out, we get lower and lower energy density. I hope you notice that it was only when the beam was fairly well established and we'd burnt quite a long way in, that the high energy part of the beam that was doing evaporation was not the part of the beam that was causing the liquid. The liquid was only happening right at the outside where the energy is very low. But it happened a long time after we started the beam. We held the beam on for a long time. So you have to build up heat in the cut to get a polished cut. Now we're going to talk about this later and we're going to demonstrate beam polishing but I want you to understand and remember this little picture here that it took a long time for the liquid to form around the outside of this cone. Now this is the low energy side of the beam and of course we're talking about the high energy side of the beam but the only difference between this side of the beam and the other side of the beam is the fact that this shape is not six millimeters diameter as it is here but it's only about 0.2 millimeters diameter when it comes out of the nozzle so there's a big energy amplification difference between what you see here and what you see down there but it's much easier to see what's going on here slow motion but it's no different than what happens after the lens the beam comes out the nozzle and the focus basically sends the beam down to a focus point like this and at this point here which is where we're currently focused that's where we get the smallest possible beam after that it starts expanding quite rapidly we can demonstrate that very easily now here's how the beam is growing between 20 and 26 mil quite a big difference as you can see so I'm going to fire a beam into that block with the distance, the correct focal distance. Six millimetres deep. Does that look as though it's bent? No. Well, I'm going to increase the pulse time now to 50 milliseconds. A twentieth of a second. Does that look like a parallel hole that I've drilled in there? Can I just point this out to you? That's a change from 18 to 26. This is a change from 18 to probably closer to 30. Look at the diameter change that's occurred between 20 and 26. So what's going on? We have a light beam that's coming down and causing an interaction with the surface and causing the material to vaporize, leaving a hole behind. But as soon as it vaporizes the first part of the hole, the laser beam does not expand. It internally reflects as though it was a um, light pipe, a fiber optic. And so that beam is focused at the surface and it does not lose its focus as it goes 12 millimeters into the material. Look, you can see that, it's the same diameter. I'm now gonna try and demonstrate to you how I think that beam drag 
is actually occurring. So, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step. Pulse, step, pulse. Now I think it's very important that you watch this piece of video again because after the formation of the very first cone you'll see the way in which the erosion takes place on the leading edge of the cut and gradually folds itself backwards. But more important than that, what I want you to watch is the gas dynamics inside the cut. You'll see swirling action, plus you'll find that there is what looks like a film, a liquid film, very thin liquid film moving around. Now it may be gas that's condensing, but whatever it is, it is, you can see after every cut that it leaves a striation mark. Pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step, pulse, step. Pulse. Following on from this, I want you to just take a quick look at a piece of enclosed gas dynamics when the laser beam goes straight down a hole. Okay, so there's a demonstration of the gas dynamics that takes place around the laser beam itself in acrylic. You've previously seen the way in which the laser beam gets deflected by the acrylic. So if you add those two things together, I think we've got a fairly reasonable explanation, a logical explanation, of how beam drag is occurring in my closed cut. Now this is a great demonstration of how striations can be formed with a pulsing mechanism. Now pulsing could either be a stepper motor edging forward which is basically what I've simulated here or if you've got one of the professional machines which uses an RF tube then they've got control of the frequency of the pulses. Although they may well have silky smooth DC motors the pulsing of the laser beam itself can cause exactly the same problem. They've got the opposite problem to what I've got on this machine. And the way that they overcome it is they change the frequency. And so you can inject very high frequencies in and so your pulses basically become so high that you don't actually see the striations. Although we've seen the creation of striations, although we've seen beam drag being demonstrated, we haven't answered my fundamental question associated with my partial depth cut and that is why am I getting striations when I've got constant speed and I've got constant power and I've got no air assist. There must be some other mechanism that's taking place. So with my distance 18 millimeters, that's the correct focal distance for that particular, for this nozzle. Um, I'm going to burn a pulse into the surface, 50 milliseconds, 20th of a second long. We can see it just here. And the reason why I'm punching this one hole in is because this is the one that's important to me. And uh, just to confirm that our readings are right, um, we'll take a plan view look at the hole, the end of the hole. This is the entry to the hole. And sure enough, the hole is about 0.5 diameter. Yep. So our side view and our plan view agree. Well now it's time to reflect on some of the results that we've just seen. 
Before we can really start analysing those results, I must go back and reinforce something that I've spoken of many times before. For those people that just drop in and drop out of these um, sessions, uh, they're going to basically lose so much of the background data. And also, this is quite a difficult concept for some people to understand. Now, the laser beam itself is a beam of concentrated invisible light. Now that's concept number one that people seem difficult, have difficulty understanding, how, can, how you can have light but it's not there. Just accept the fact that there is something there because when you put your hand in the way it'll get burnt, if you put a piece of paper in the way it'll get burnt, there's energy there that does something. And that energy in that beam is not uniform. Like this light here, it is concentrated in the middle as I'm showing you there, but it gets dull towards the outside where there's less and less light. So this is a concept called energy density. We've got much higher levels of energy in the middle here of the beam than we have on the outside of the beam. Bear with me for a few moments because I'm going to turn this picture around and I'm going to ask you to imagine that this is a rain cloud. And this is the amount of rain that's in the rain cloud. It's heavy in the middle because there's a lot of rain in the middle of that black cloud. It's spring, it's showery, and the rain is going to pass overhead. Now, I think you can immediately see that just at this point here, if you're standing underneath at that point, you're going to get absolutely soaked because we're going to get a mini flood just here. Whereas at the outside of the cloud here, there's going to be hardly any rain falling at all. Not enough to even water your carrots. With that little concept in mind of rain, not much rain coming down here and a lot of rain coming down here in the middle. Let's turn the picture back round again. And instead of rain, it's light. I know they're not the same thing, one is solid and one is not, but the principle is the same. We've got amounts of energy, amounts of water, whatever you want to call it, there's a variable density of things that are happening inside this beam. When that beam hits a surface, two things can happen. First of all, it could be reflected off like a mirror, and, and that does happen for metals. But we're talking about acrylic, which is a non-metal, and it's a rather special type of non-metal material, which has got some interesting properties. So let's not worry about other materials, let's just stay with the principle of acrylic. And what will happen is, this energy, this rain, will fall on the surface in the middle here, and instead of causing a flood, this light, it's a rather special light, infrared, which reacts with things and causes them to get excited. Now, all molecules are busy just sitting there like this at room temperature. If you start exciting them with extra energy, they get faster. And as they get faster vibrations, their temperature goes up. So what we're actually doing here, we're firing light at the surface of the acrylic and we're exciting the acrylic molecules on the surface. And that is the critical word that I want you to remember, surface. On the surface, we're exciting those molecules and those molecules then raise their temperature. Now, if we go back to the rain idea and the density idea, we've got a lot more rain, a lot more energy falling in the middle here than we have at the outside. We've got just a few little bits of energy falling here and lots of energy in the middle. And so what happens is there'll be not much heating effect on the acrylic out here at the edge but a huge amount of heating taking place just in the middle where we've got the highest energy density. I've drawn this shape in here as the energy profile of the beam, but you mustn't regard this energy profile as being something like a drill. It doesn't automatically produce that same shape in the material. Approximately, approximately it does. But the principle is really, we're looking at this as energy density, not as an actual shape. So what happened is the heating takes place on these surface molecules here and where we've got very high energy density the excitement will be great and we will instantly heat these molecules up and they will 
evaporate. They will go through a liquid phase very, very quickly and immediately turn into vapour. Now, as they turn into vapour, what will happen is we will have a piece of clean acrylic left behind. And that clean acrylic is a hard surface. And that hard surface will again be excited by the light that's falling on it. The molecules will heat up and they will in turn evaporate. So although we've got very high energy in the middle here, we mustn't forget that we've also got energy out here as well. And as time goes on, this energy on the outside here will have time to have an effect as well. So gradually, we will get a bigger and bigger erosion. And this is what's happening. It's an erosion that's taking place on this surface. And we've seen that erosion. There it is. Look, they're all over the place where I keep testing things. And as we saw in this hole that we made here, after a certain period of time, no, I'm using the word time again, there was enough time to allow even this part of the low energy to start heating up the edge of the material. And that was just enough temperature there to keep that part in its liquid phase. Whereas down here, there was enough energy to push it through its liquid phase and make it disappear into a vapour because we've got very high energy density here. The light in itself is harmless, but it has to interact with the surface to change its energy form from light to heat. It in itself does not heat it only stimulates the material that it hits to heat up. OK, so we've got that piece of science out the way. Now we're coming back to our subject that we're looking at, which is where these striation marks come from. We burn a 0.2 diameter hole in a piece of paper. Now with exactly the same power, exactly the same focus point, and exactly the same amount of time, we pushed it into a piece of acrylic and the end result was that the acrylic produced a hole which was 0.5 diameter. So why the difference when I fire that beam into a piece of acrylic? We'd previously seen the gas dynamics taking place in that tube there when we fired the laser beam into it and held the power on. You could see the gases swirling around inside there. And we also saw exactly the same sort of dramatic gas dynamics that were taking place when we're producing our beam drag experiment. So we have to assume that the reason why this hole has grown from 0.2, which appears to be the beam diameter, to 0.5 is the fact that we've got some sort of interaction between the acrylic and the laser beam, which is causing some sort of gas cloud around the outside of it. The heating effect, plus possibly, and this could also be a possibility, none of this is fact because all this is supposition based on what we've seen. We have a laser beam coming in, and remember, it has internal reflection because the pipe is continuously focusing down. And so we've got complete internal reflection there. Now, it's possible that every time that we get a reflection, we may well get some of this erosion taking place. And that may well be the reason why we're getting a bigger diameter hole. So this is garage science. This is not NASA laboratory science. And going from 0.2 to 0.5 leaves me with the impression that what we could assume is that there is no solid material here for this laser beam to react with. Now, the laser beam itself, as I said, has to react with solid material, a solid clean surface. It has to excite atoms. And if all we've got is a gas cloud here, it might ex excite the gas cloud, but it's not doing anything to remove material from the edge of our solid block. So when the laser beam starts to move that way, nothing happens until this high powered central part of the beam at least starts to get involved with solid material again here. Now at that point 
we're going to start generating another cloud like that. And then it's going to carry on jumping across this void of nothing which it can't erode until it gets to here. When again it produces a cloud of gas like this. Now this is going to continue ad infinitum while we're carrying out the cut but look what we've got here. These little nodes here I'm proposing that those are the nodes that are the striations. It may be exaggerated or they may be aliasing between these patterns and the pulsing of the laser beam or the frequency of the stepper motor. So we may get some rather strange and random patterns but the underlying striations are produced by this mechanism here I'm proposing. So how do we get rid of these striations on a cut? Well the answer is actually quite simple. We've already discovered the answer and that is we allow enough time for heat to build up on the edge of the cut. And heat building up on the edge of the cut means we shall get a liquid film taking place. And that liquid film will naturally want to smooth out and take away the peaks. But it does depend on heat being retained in the cut itself. So if you cut too fast, you will probably create striations. These are the sorts of things that we're now going to investigate. We know that this is cast per specs because it's got labelling on it. As I mentioned before, no labelling generally means extruded. So we're going to use this one and a half inch lens to start with without air assist. You'll know when air assist is on because listen, you can hear it. So we're running this on full power, about 70%, and 9 millimetres a second. This is cast acrylic. So now we'll run the same test again, but we'll run it with air assist. Although the pump is a pulsing pump, because it goes through so many restrictions and the flow that comes out here is nothing like that coming out of the pump or what the pump is capable of, basically what comes out here is a pretty smooth flow. I think if you listen, you can hear that there's no real serious indication of pulsing. Well that's a little bit unexpected because I would say that that's probably slightly better with air assist than without air assist. We'll go and catch that in some sunlight in a minute and you can compare the difference for yourself. I've got the power set as high as I can to try and get as much heat as possible into the cut. Remember if we can keep heat in the cut we shall have a, um, we shall have a liquid film in there which heals the surface over and helps to cure any striations. Now that's quite a nice hot cut there. I can feel it. I didn't want to hold my hand on there for too long. It's certainly, I suppose people would class that as mirror polish, but I'm looking at it extremely critically and saying, well, I can still see a few striations in the background there. We've got a full set of data there, cast, extruded, cast, extruded, both clear and black. So we can look at the edge comparisons for those with and without air assist. Okay, now we're going from one extreme to the other. We've now got a two and a half inch lens in there, two and a half inch meniscus lens. And uh, we're going to see whether or not 70% power is enough with this huge distance here to burn through probably something like five and a half millimeter thick acrylic with almost miraculous results. Having established that we've got a lovely soft cut with that lens, what I want to do is something completely different. Now I've now programmed this machine to draw a line. So if I press the origin button, I know that I'm going to get no movement in Y. 
the machine doesn't know where X is, it, it's wherever X happens to be. And when I run the program, the X drive is going to run, but of course I'm going to get no motion here. So I should be able to switch my control on and off, and whatever I've programmed into the machine will happen down here. Now I'm going to be using dot mode, because what I want to do is to produce a series of pulses, downward pulses, to see if I can cut this off with pulses. Basically what I'm trying to do is to start simulating what happens with one of the professional machines where they have a pulsing laser beam. Now I don't, well I'm absolutely certain I won't be able to get up to 20 kilohertz pulse frequency that they can achieve, but we might be able to get a little way into that range and see what effect it has on the cut. So at the moment what I've done, I've got it set to a dot time of 0.1, which is 100 milliseconds. Now I think I might put air assist on, because I suspect it's going to flame up. This produced a nail file. So those are pretty big. Uh, let's call them striations, shall we? <laughs> but they're not natural, they're forced striations because they're nice and straight, straight down. But it's lovely and polished as well. So here's the trick that I'm just trying to play on the machine. The machine thinks it's going to scan a square somewhere out here and it's going to do it at one millimeter per second. So it's going to take a long time to do a single scan. But what I've also asked it to do, to run at 70% in special mode. So that means technically I suppose I'm running with 50% power. It should be running with a frequency of about 20k. So if this is in any way successful, it should be a fairly close simulation to what an RF tube can do. something didn't burn through quite but it gives us an idea maybe of what possibly could be achieved with a Trotec, Epilog, Universal Machine, those sorts of machines that use high frequency pulsing but of course I can't really say at the moment because we haven't burnt all the way through. The only thing that I can possibly do is to use thinner material. Now this looks like 3mm clear. But I have to assume that from its lovely shiny finish that it must be um, extruded acrylic. Now I can try a proper piece of extruded acrylic but even so it's still got smooth with striations on. Now these last four black ones are extruded acrylic. Now can you tell which ones are done with air assist and which ones are done without air assist? They're all basically the same as each other. As you can see there is just a hint of striations on the surface. Now the next four black ones along, again, is there any difference between them? Two of them are done at 70%, two of them are done at 20% and there's a mix of air assist and non-air assist in there. Again, you can't tell the difference. So here we come on to these next four. They're all different heights but if I move them in the light probably you can see they're all shiny-ish, fairly polished. So these are all again extruded acrylic. virtually no difference between air assist and no air assist and then all of these here are varying speeds with cast acrylic, air assist and no air assist and again I will guarantee that if you check those out I mean particularly all this lot here because you can see they're, they're all just happen to be reflecting the same no difference between them at all
One of these was done with the uh, 20 kilohertz high frequency engraving mode and one was done with just normal common mode. The smoothest one, which is nearly okay, was 20% common mode and this one here which has got striations on it was in fact 70% uh, special mode. So what did we learn from this first session? Well, even though we've got a silky smooth Travis action and we've got a lovely continuous power and we've proved that this time, we still get striations in acrylic when we try to cut it. Those people that said that striations are induced by the stepper motor were perfectly correct, but not entirely so, because there's another natural set of striations that appear to be there in the background. Well, it may look as though I haven't moved and I haven't been doing anything, but trust me, not true. Well, now you know that regardless of how we try and get rid of striations, it's a natural part of cutting acrylic. What we're now going to do is to take a look at how we overlay those striations with machine-created striations because of the stepper motor. Now, at the end of that video, you saw me messing around with the 20 kilohertz special mode signal. And even on 20 kilohertz, you were still able to detect the edge striations from the pulses of power. So it was able to get better results with just ordinary common mode and smooth motion. Now, you're probably all aware of my love of acrylic. It's a reasonably good material to work with and I do a lot of structural work with it. But the thing that I really love about it is it's a fantastic telltale material. It's a piece of material which enables me to test all sorts of things on this machine. One of the things that it can tell me is the velocity of the head or the varying power of the beam. I've got a piece of acrylic, little acrylic block standing on edge there because it's much easier to see through a piece of thin acrylic than it is to see through the block. Now we're going to start off at a fairly slow speed. We're going to start off at 50 millimetres a second and we'll see what happens. Okay, so that's 50 millimetres a second. Okay, so now we do 350 millimetres a second. Now in this picture here, you can see, because I'm only accelerating up to 50 millimetres a second, it gets up to speed very quickly, and there isn't much of a slope on the right-hand side before we get to this saw action, this sawtooth look. And that is the actual stepper motor moving along in steps. As the stepper motor stops between its steps, or at least slows down between its steps, the power of the beam, which is constant, digs in deeper. And then it jumps to the next step and it leaves a little sawtooth. So that's what we're seeing there in that picture. It's a great interpretation of the velocity of the head, or the velocity of the laser beam, because they're one and the same thing. Now when I change the speed to 350 millimetres a second, all of a sudden the picture changes. Look, it takes probably a third of the length to get up to speed. And when we do get to speed, we appear to have no apparent steps in the stepper motor. Basically, the faster you run, the less the steps show up. But you say, well, how does that affect striations? Well. <laughs> It affects them quite a lot. Just ask yourself, what speed am I going to cut six millimeter acrylic at? Five, eight, 10 millimeters a second? Now this is what you cut six or eight millimeter thick acrylic at. So really the point of this exercise is to just demonstrate to you how sensitive the edge of your cut is to the speed that you're cutting. There's nothing that you can do about it. It will cut with striations because of the stepper motor. And those striations will be mixed in with the natural striations that you've seen in the previous part of the video. We're going to use five millimeter for our testing at the moment because that's a fairly middle of the road sort of thickness that many people will use. Now, the first thing I must point out to you is something that you will all know. 
There are two types of acrylic. One of them is called cast and the other is called extruded. There is a big difference between the cutting and the engraving performances of these two materials. They are both acrylic. One is good for one purpose and the other is good for another purpose. And that will become clear as we get a little bit further into this test. That's not bad. We don't have much beam drag on that. It's a fairly vertical cut and it should drop out because the smoke is going down below. Okay, now I was using air assist on that as well. Now, on the surface of it, that looks quite a shiny finish. But there are marks on it, there are striation marks on it. Now we'll take the air assist off and we'll do the same thing again. Right at the top of the cut, it's a lovely smooth finish, but down at the bottom of the cut, we've still got our striations. The one thing that we need for a really good polished finish is a lot of low level energy on the edge of the cut. And the way that we get low level energy into the edge of the cut is to slow the cut Set down. The speed to five millimeters a second now. Now, I hope you can also see something else. This is hanging in here by a piece of warm <laughs> molten acrylic. Remember what I promised you at five millimeters a second? It's a terrible cut if it doesn't go through, but here's what happens when it does go through, look. We don't get this cut here because we're not running at 50 millimeters a second, which is what this was done at. We're running at five millimeters a second here. And you can even see in this one how it's actually produced a nice, shiny, burnished finish on the edge of the cut. And that's exactly what this has done here. We've run it at about half the speed that we would normally want to run it at, but it produces a crystal clear mirror finish. There is hardly a hint of striation on there. And that's all because we've got this liquid phase that we kept in the cut. Let's see if I can find a piece of five millimeter cast acrylic to compare it with. So if we go back and repeat our previous three tests, it's got a bit of a shine. You can see every single mark on the surface there. So let's run the same test without air assist now. Is there any difference? Nice vertical striations. But as I said, those striations are now induced by the stepper motor. So now we'll go to half speed. No air assist. And I've just put that on my lip. And to be honest, it's hot. <laughs> Very hot. <laughs> I jumped. So we've got plenty of heat in the job now. And all of a sudden, even though this is cast acrylic, we've nearly got that mirror finish. I think unless you look at it very carefully, which I am being very critical, there's just a hint of striations in the background. But I think anybody that wants a really clean mirror cut would get it. But you have to drop the speed to get heat into the job. So for the cutting war, cast acrylic, comes off second best. Cast acrylic, no air assist, half speed. Same square, the bottom one was done at 90 degrees. Now there's lots of striations on the top one that aren't there on the bottom one. Why would that be? Now that's because we've not just got one stepper motor stepping like that we've got two stepper motors that are stepping like this to produce a compound angle. And so all of a sudden, even though we've got the potential ability to produce a mirror cut, as soon as we start traveling at an angle and using compound use of the X and Y, then we run into trouble. And what do we get on a circle? You can hear the stepper motors singing. Now I'm going to be very careful, I'm going to mark 12 o'clock and when we look around that circle we'll see distinct patterns somewhere towards the top here where the stepper motors are nearly working on their own just here 
and here and here and here, we get a nearly mirror finish. But where we get to the 45 degree mark here, I don't know whether you can see that in the light, but there are lots of striations there. Now bear in mind we're talking now about cast acrylic. Let's do the same last two tests with the extruded acrylic. And we have to say that wherever we look around that circle, we're getting a beautiful mirror polished edge. Now I expect exactly the same result when we do our 45 degree cut. Okay, I'm going to just touch this. I can feel it on my hand as I touch it. Whoa, yes, that's pretty hot. But I think you'd definitely class that as a good mirror polish. We've started this engraving off fast with very little power. But even so, look what's happening to the surface. Now we're doing a cut. Hopefully it's going to be a mirror finish cut. Now, normally when you engrave a acrylic, you would normally reverse the image and engrave on the back. So that when you turn it over, you see a nice clean image. Now, the problem here is, it's not too bad. It's not heavily caked on because we were using very small amount of power. Look, I can actually rub and get a reasonably clean piece of text. This is extruded acrylic. Let's put the power up to 50%, still running at 400 millimeters a second. Even closing the lid and passing air across the surface, it's not having any significant effect on the painting effect of the vapor. But this time, I cannot rub some of this debris off. It's really caked on there and even if I try and wash it off it won't come off. I can try cleaning it with isopropyl alcohol and that works reasonably well. But one of the problems you'll see... Hey, look what's happened to the edges. The isopropyl alcohol has actually stress cracked around the edge of my cut. Now the film on the underside of that is a bit tatty, but the film on the top side is in reasonably good condition. Now I know that this is a piece of extruded acrylic because there is no name on it. If there was a name on it, it would be cast acrylic, but if there's no name on it, it's extruded acrylic. Let's put the power back up to 50%. If you really want some deep and white text on extruded acrylic, then not only do you keep the tape on, but you also add air assist. And the air assist will drive the vapour back down into your cut and make it nice and white. Now while that's going on in the background there, let's take the film off here and examine our result. We're also taking the crud off as well. We should have to take the centre of the letters out as well, because they tend to get stuck in. Now the one at the bottom with air assist is a little bit stronger. This one is a little bit blotchy in places. That's our engraving. And there's our edges, our mirror polished edges. As it clearly says on there, cast acrylic. Name on one side, film on the other. So we know that this is cast acrylic, but unfortunately I don't have any 5mm cast acrylic at the moment. So we're going to have to live with 8mm thick. And we'll repeat this very last test here, which was air assist, 50% power, with a film. Let's put it against the dark surface so that you can see the difference. The one on the left is cast acrylic, the one on the right is extruded acrylic. Now when it comes to engraving, you would choose cast acrylic every time because it gives a much cleaner, crisper result. Sadly, sadly, the edge is clean, but 
full of striations, fairly fine striations, as you can see. So as a general rule, whenever I do engraving, I leave the plastic covering on. We're now running this at two millimeters a second. But for eight millimeter thick, if I want a polished finish on it, I think I'm gonna to have to go this slow. You'll never get the high shine that you can get on a piece of extruded acrylic. As you can see, it's a sort of a, it's not a matte sheen, it's, it's actually quite a nice clean finish. Free of striations, which is the important thing. Let's do some thin material. Now this is three millimeter thick. And I should easily be able to cut this with 65% power at probably 15, maybe even 20 millimeters a second. This is extruded acrylic, remember. This is the easy stuff to cut and polish. Well, it's shiny. They're very distinctive striations, but they're on a shiny surface. Now, to make life simple, I've just suppressed the scanning because we don't need that information. We just want the cut information now. So I've reduced the cut to half its speed, 10 millimeters a second. Well, it's not bad. We've still got some, I'm being super critical here, but we've still got some striations on the surface. Shiny. So this time we're gonna take it right down to five millimeters a second. Now I want you to watch. Can you see the boiling that's taking place on the bottom of the cut there, about a quarter of an inch behind the cut? We're almost back to a mirror finish, but we've had to go down by from 20 right down to five millimeters a second. The thinner the material, the more difficult it is to cut. That's always been my experience because you just can't get the heat to stay in the cut. What do we take away from that? I suppose we could sum it up very simply by saying there are two sorts of striations, one natural, one motor induced. And what we've seen is that you can get rid of most of the motor induced striations by running slowly and building heat up in the cut. You start off with an advantage if you're using extruded acrylic. Now the job becomes so much harder if you decide to use cast acrylic. It's that much more difficult to get a flame burnished finish. You can get a nice finish and if you do it right with thick enough material you'll be able to get a nearly striation free finish. The thinner the material whether it's cast or whether it's extruded, you'll begin to struggle with the striation. Although cast acrylic has got its weaknesses when it comes to getting a nice finish on the edge, it's a superb material for engraving on. It produces nice, white, crisp images. One of the reasons I wanted you to understand that the different whiteness of engravings between cast and extruded acrylic is because here I've got a little pattern of a picture frame and I've managed to do a dot picture in there, one of my dot pictures. I've done another one here, a further one here and now we're going to get all spooky because this is really what I wanted to show you. Here's what you can do with those pictures. We can just take that picture out and we can slip this picture in. We can change its colour. Let's put it to white. Pink, blue, white. Now the horse is not so good because dots do not transfer, don't transfer the light up very well. Plus the fact that this is actually a piece of extruded acrylic. And that didn't work too well at all. Okay, so here's one of our engraved nameplates. When I put the light over it, it comes alive. Now that's not the best example because I can't get down inside there. This base, which you can buy off of eBay for about £10, you'll find the information about this on the Think Lace Up website. So I think we've overdosed on acrylic now and uh, you should be moderately aware and competent of all the variations and things that you can do with acrylic and you shouldn't do with acrylic. So go forth and enjoy. Be creative with your machine. Till the next session, 
Bye.